the Malabo Montpellier Forum. My name is Laie Butake, and I'm Director of Communication and Outreach for Academia 2063. We are now moving on to part two of this meeting, and we are kicking off this round with four fireside chats spanning trade, digitalization, energy, and livestock. To kick off the session, I will now invite Dr. Leon Jackson, who is the head of Division Agri-Food Trade and Markets at OECD. Dr. Jackson, we have five, 10 minutes for the session. The floor is yours. Great, thank you so much. Um, and let me first say how much I appreciate being included in this group um, to hear all the distinguished speakers and to learn um, from the discussions. So it's really my great pleasure to be able to introduce the next expert who um, will profile on this uh, fireside chat, and that's Dr. Ismail Fofana. He's been working as the Director for Capacity and Development at Academia 2063, and previously he was associated with IFPRI's um, West and Central African office as well. He's done, he has a lifetime of work <laughs> working on agriculture, food macro policies, and poverty reduction. So it's really a pleasure um, to be able to chat with him. And our topic is international trade and regional trade. Um, and we know, of course, that the Malibu Montpellier panel report, Trading Up, had a lot of suggestions about what kinds of policies would be um, particularly relevant for the continent. Um, so I'm hoping that we can tease out some of these lessons in the questions that I'll pose to Dr. Fofana. So the first question I have for you, um, for Dr. Fofana, is related to the creation of the African Continental Free Trade Area in 2018, which is regarded really as the turning point for African and regional and international trade. It's predicted that the AFC FTA will be the largest free trade area established since the WTO in terms of the number of member states covering a market of more than 1.2 billion people and up to 3 trillion US dollars in combined GDP. So these are obviously massive numbers. Um, could you tell us what you think are the relevant policies that African governments need to put in place to tap into the potential opportunities provided by the AFC FTA? The floor is yours. Thank you, Madam, Madam Moderator. Can you uh, hear me? Yes, that's good. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, thanks, go ahead. Thank, thank you, thank you. It's a pleasure to be, uh, to be here. And uh, I would like to thank the organizer for the opportunity. Um, Thank you for the question. Um, the uh, African Continental Free Trade Area uh, is a flagship program of the first 10 years implementation plan of the African Union uh, 2063 agenda. Uh, here to support uh, and strengthen in economic integration in Africa. Uh, uh, in terms of policy innovation, um, we can learn um, some important lessons and experiences uh, in terms of strengthening intra-regional Africa trade uh, in Africa from uh, some leading, uh, uh, three leading uh, regional economic uh, communities in Africa. Uh, those are, uh, are, are uh, SADC, uh, COMESA, and ECOWAS. Uh, SADC is the Southern African Development Community. Uh, COMESA is the common market for Eastern and Southern Africa, and ECOWAS is the economic community for West African state. Um, some, some of the uh, lessons we've learned, uh, you know, with those uh, regional economic communities in terms of boosting into uh, uh, intra-regional trade uh, are, for example, fast tracking the trade facilitation arrangement at the RECS level. Um, this includes uh, reducing tariff and non-tariff trade barriers, NTBs. Uh, it's preliminary evidence uh, studies uh, indicates uh, by eliminating import duties under the implementation of the uh, African continental free trade uh, uh, area, 
would boost uh, the intra-Africa trade by more than 50%, 52%, more precisely. And then if you add non-tariff trade barriers, you eliminate non-tariff trade barriers to the, uh, the, the import uh, tariff elimination, then you will double the intra-Africa trade. So it is, it is very important that countries start by fast tracking the, uh, by uh, reducing tariff, reducing tariff and non-tariff barriers in order to, to, to make uh, progress towards the, 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 the target that are set under the, uh, the AFCF, CFTA. The second uh, policies that can be also contributed in place uh, uh, is harmonizing quality and sanitary and phytosanitary standard. This is important because studies have uh, shown that uh, SPS measures raise the price of African food foodstuffs by 14%. So by harmonizing the, uh, the standard and facilitating uh, the movement of goods, uh, reducing these barriers, uh, then you will uh, certainly uh, benefit from uh, you know, reducing uh, prices. Um, the other policy uh, measure that is important also to, to be in place is uh, the information system. We need to have to develop and uh, disseminate a regional and continental information system to make sure that we reduce information asymmetry among trading partners uh, in order to increase the efficiency of markets. And uh, I will also add another one, uh, the uh, information and communication technologies, another uh, important system that policies need to be in place to, to adopt, to, uh, to promote the adoption of the ICT system and more importantly, to make sure that they are coordinated, uh, it, they are coordinated across uh, uh, among different uh, the trading partners in the region. Um, this is very important because uh, as the volume and the diversity of shipment grow under the African continent of free trade area, then ICT become critical, become critical in terms of maintaining the trade competitiveness, but also reducing costs. And finally, uh, another policy that I think it's important also that African government should put in place is um, uh, in order to benefit um, to, 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 to potential, the potential opportunities that are created under the, the free trade agreement and, or free trade area is uh, policies that promote uh, the use of public and private partnership to finance cross-border and intra-trade infrastructure. Uh, this will uh, help removing this type of physical barrier. And one uh, example of uh, this kind of successful, successful PPP is the toll road from Maputo to Pretoria that was uh, uh, financed in, 20, uh, in 1977 and for, for 30 years. And then by adapting those lessons, uh, African government can accelerate the progress towards the targets uh, that are set under the uh, African continent of free trade areas. I'll stop here, ma'am. Thank you. That's great. Thank you so much. You drew out so many great themes um, about harmonizing efforts across countries, about creating enabling environment for communication technologies and IP um, information systems, the importance of data and evidence. So I really appreciate your reflections on that. So given our, our 10 minute um, fireside chat limit, I would like to now ask you a question about COVID because um, I think the examples you gave were not really focusing on the question of um, the kinds of actions that uh, regional at the regional or continental level could help strengthen resilience to maximize the benefits of trade. So I'll pick up this question about COVID impacts. So we know that COVID impacts were predicted to result in trade volumes decreasing and that many governments took efforts to combat the 
pandemic, including border closures and curfews, and that these could have an especially strong impact on informal cross-border trade. Um, and uh, so the COVID-related measures forced many small traders to give up trading over several months. What are some of the actions at regional or continental level to strengthen crisis preparedness and resilience to maximize the benefits of international intra-regional trade? Over to you. Oh, all right, thank you, thank you, ma'am. Um, uh, um, intra-regional trade, yes, can contribute to increase uh, resilience uh, of countries to crises, to shocks, uh, but also we know that uh, crises can also affect uh, or disrupt trade. Uh, and uh, the current trend that we have been, the positive trend that we have been seeing uh, in terms of intra-regional uh, trade uh, uh, across Africa are likely be, uh, to be uh, negatively or ad adversely affected by the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, for instance, we, we heard um, numbers have shown that um, in Nairobi, the average price of uh, maize rose by 10% between April 2019 and April 2020 uh, due to the COVID pandemic. Uh, then uh, when, and, and, uh, when uh, policy responses are not coordinated across countries, that will exacerbate you know, the negative impact or the adverse impact that uh, a crisis like COVID can bring. Uh, we can we have example of uh, examples of um, the Ebola crisis when Rwanda uh, and uh, DRC borders was closed because of the Ebola and then that uh, contributed to increase the surge uh, you know prices the prices of some uh, staples uh, fruits and vegetables in borders town so um, coordination is important is crucial. Uh, we need to coordinate policy responses within RECs and at the continental level. Uh, and um, a positive example of this is ECOWAS with the Ebola crisis. Ebola, uh, uh, ECOWAS established an outbreak coordination center, which contribute to, uh, to, 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 to improve the response uh, capacity uh, within the region to facilitate uh, intra-regional trade. So it's important that uh, Rex, uh, uh, Rex secretaries, uh, and also the African Continental Free Trade uh, Area Secretary, they play the leading role in formulating in the formulation of such joint policy responses. Uh, and it is also important that at the country level, that this coordination also happen there. When we have a coordination centers at the country level, a task force at the country level, at the regional level also, that can contribute to strengthen um, you know, the, the preparedness uh, to future crisis, but also build resilience to ensure that the main corridor for trade are maintained open in the times of crisis, and then that will enhance uh, the, the, the benefit of uh, uh, intra-regional trade. In the region. Thank you so much. I'm sorry to, to cut us short, but um, I'm looking at my clock and it tells me my 10 minutes is, is wrapping up. But I think what your point is so excellently made is um, by you can't count on being able to coordinate from scratch. So having existing mechanism, like the example you gave about ECOWAS's um, experience um, coordinating through the Ebola crisis, having that experience of coordinating can help you then the next time you have to face a crisis. So that was really an excellent, um, an excellent uh, lesson to draw out from that. So thank you very much, Dr. Fofana. I'm going to wrap up the fireside chat um, and pass over to our next our next fireside chat topic, which is on digitalization. So I'll pass the floor over to Ambassador uh, Professor Mohamedou Ka, who's the permanent representative of the Gambia for the United Nations office in Geneva. Um, Professor Ka, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Leanne Jackson, for that wonderful segment. And uh, we thank Ismail for uh, sharing his perspectives and very valuable insights. Um, I have the honor and pleasure to introduce our next panelist, um, uh, uh, Mr. Bolaji. Mr. Bolaji is the chairman 
of the board of Vuren, Vurean, Vurean Corelli. Yeah, I, yeah, I hope I'm, I'm pronouncing it right. Um, yes. Yeah, Vurean Corelli is a marketplace company that provides a platform to match buyers, sellers, commodity aggregators, logistics partners, financiers, and food processors to ensure the economic well-being of all stakeholders. He's also the co-founder of Cellulant Nigeria Limited. He comes to us as an entrepreneur per excellence, creating solutions uh, that are impactful for the agri-tech sector. Um, uh, we have uh, uh, the privilege to, uh, uh, to engage him on three key questions um, that build on from uh, the work of the Malabo Montpellier panel. Uh, we had a report that you can have access to through our platform called Byte by Byte. Uh, that report captures policy innovations uh, for transforming Africa's food systems with digital technologies. Uh, now, uh, Mr. Bolaji, the question I have for you, uh, the first question is, Africa's digital transformation is well on the way, allowing the continent to leverage the benefits of new technologies for food systems transformation. How African countries position themselves to harness and deploy such technologies will determine the success of digitalized agriculture operations in improving African sustainability, food security, and prosperity. Now, what policies and institutional structures need to be put in place to stimulate the innovation and adoption of digital technologies in the food systems? Uh, please proceed, Mr. Balaji. Yeah, thank you, Ambassador Ka, and I would also like to thank the organizers for inviting me. I will go straight to the point. The question of um, stimulating innovation in agriculture through digital, it's a very, very important one. And in order to kind of guide government in terms of what to do, we need to have clarity on what is the problem we want to solve for. And for me, agriculture is one of the most complicated economic segments in any country in the world. Because unlike other economic segments, it has so many actors, from the farmer to the village aggregator, to the logistics guy, to the processor, to the distributor, to the bank, to the insurance guy, to the credit guarantee, so many actors. But the whole system is not functioning as an integrated whole. So from a policy perspective, what would be my recommendation to government? I would say at the country and continental level, we need to now begin to implement open data standards and open data frameworks. Because in agriculture, you see a lot of duplication of efforts. So let's take an example, a simple thing like farmer registration. You discover that governments are registering farmers, private sector actors are registering farmers, development actors are registering farmers, cooperatives are registering farmers. And you see so much duplication and waste. When we begin to implement open data standards and open data frameworks as a policy position, we begin to harmonize and standardize all these things and begin to promote sharing. So in my view, we need to promote policies that ensure that information is shared much more easily in agriculture. It's something I've always found unique about agriculture, large economic segments, but information sharing is very, very poor. And everybody seems to work in silos. So that would be my first policy recommendation. From an institutional framework, if we want to stimulate digital innovation, we need to create what I refer to as the digital register of agricultural assets. And we need this digital register at the country level and at the continental level. And what is supposed to be in this register? It's actually supposed to contain the inventory of all assets whether they be private sector assets, public sector assets, development partner assets, um, NGO assets. So that we begin now to kind of achieve equitable development across a country. If you take a look at our country, um, called our country, Nigeria, for example, you begin to see lots and lots of investments. But because of the absence of such a register that somebody can go to and say, if I'm a farmer, I'm looking for 
a particular variety of seed. Where do I go to know who has the seed? If I produce and I want a place to store and there's nowhere for me to store my grains, how do I know that in the next village, there's a community warehouse I can take my things to? Jahel spoke. If I'm looking for a tractor, where do I go to get access to the information about which tractors are available? So those would be the two things I would say because of time on this, on this particular point. If you do these things now, we can now, innovators can now build on them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Balaji, for that very, very in, insightful perspective. Um, the second question I have for you is um, Africa's rural areas and smallholder farmers in particular could greatly benefit from access to new technologies and reliable data that would help them make more informed decisions and get more value from their produce as you have just shared with us in, in the last question. Now, a sound digitalization environment that embraces smallholder farmers and other actors along the agriculture value chain will ensure that Africa's rural areas are not left behind. So given the backdrop of that and what you have shared with us, what actions need to be taken by government or governments to ensure that entrepreneurship and innovations in digitalized agriculture is inclusive of smaller scale activities? And thank you very much for, for, for that question. And I will answer with just one sentence. Um, government needs to lower um, barriers to entry for farmers. Mm -hmm. And lower barrier to entry for what exactly? In my mind, it's lower barrier to entry for three things. Number one is make it easy for uh, farmers to have smartphones. In the 21st century, a smartphone is the doorway to economic inclusion. You know, we always talk about financial inclusion, but anybody who is not economically included cannot be financially included. Economic inclusion precedes financial inclusion. So I think um, making it possible for as many farmers in rural areas to have access to smartphones is super, super important because we open the world to them. Number two is to lower barriers to credit and to insurance. And these two things are very, very important. I sincerely believe that our government must now use new forms of credit scoring in our agriculture sector. There are new models now, satellite-based credit scoring, that based on the area of land you are cultivating, based on what you can cultivate, we can allocate you a credit score, you can gain access to financing. So I think government as a policy needs to create those um, national frameworks to be able to say in this part of a country, in this part of the continent, this is the credit score so that financial service providers can go there. And then on the bit of insurance, and I will, I will build on the comment that Brian made when he was talking about irrigation. Our farmers don't have security of income. And I sincerely believe that we need to figure out how to do revenue protection insurance for, for farmers. In Nigeria, we call it guaranteed minimum price, which is every farming season, farmers should have an idea that what's the minimum price that they should be able to sell their produce for. And we build insurance frameworks around that that if it swings it that way, this is how we cover them. I sincerely believe that if we do these three things now, digital as an enabler for economic empowerment just begins to, to fly and to thrive. That's how I respond to that, Ambassador Ka. Thank you, Bolaji. Thank you. And um, that uh, last point actually connect to our last question. We, I wish we had more time to, to engage you further because this is a very, very exciting but very important topic in the agriculture value chain and, and ecosystem. Uh, there is a pressing need, Bolaji, for both private and public sector R&D to develop digital tools and services that address the persistent challenges across the agriculture value chain, not just in farming, but also around post-harvest losses and processing. More investment in R&D is critical to developing cutting edge digital solutions that meet the need of all value chain actors as you alluded into, into the last question that you answered. Now, the third question is, given that backdrop, what role can the private sector 
play in mobilizing the required investment for agriculture digitalization? You began um, uh, alluding to it in your last intervention. And what policy and fiscal incentives can encourage Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. With, with regards to the role of private sector, in my own mind, it's actually a simple thing. And it's a, I see it as a messaging, as a messaging role for the private sector. I think the private sector has a big role to play in communicating the message to the investment community that agriculture is a business. It's not a development project. I think if that message sinks in, to pension funds, to venture capitalists, capital will flow into agriculture. Up until recently, people were not taking agriculture as a business. People saw it as a, a like, like a toy that some specialists are, are playing in one corner. So I think private sector will have a huge role to communicate that, that idea. And that's why the work that um, people like Jail are doing is super, super important. And then from the policy perspective, I see three things. Um, one is the tax incentives. I sincerely believe that anybody who is investing in agriculture should have significant tax incentives, simply because it's not an easy area to invest in, and it's an area that requires patient capital. So I think um, innovators need to be encouraged to, to direct capital that way. The second thing is the question of interest rates. If you want to raise bonds for agriculture, um, we should be able to raise bonds at very low interest rates for agricultural investments. I think that will help significantly from an incentives, policy incentives perspective. And then the second thing is guarantees. Agriculture can be risky because it just takes um, a season of pests to wipe out all the investments. So how do we now begin to, not to take away the risk because if you take away all the risk, you create another problem, but to share the risk <laughs> equitably. You know, those are the three policy areas that I think um, government should focus on. Thank you, Ambassador Ka. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Balaji, for your very thoughtful um, responses to these very vital questions, which I'm sure we will have an opportunity to engage you more. Um, uh, to leave the audience, I think one very important takeaway uh, from your intervention is the importance of sharing of quality information and data. But to go beyond just data and sharing of information, but to ensure that we have smart policy regimes that can put in place data infrastructure and digital infrastructure that will embody the issues that you have raised around asset registration, around open data systems and, and data governance. I think the crux of it is to go beyond the rhetoric around digitalization and digital tools in agriculture and factor the centrality of policy regimes that can put at the center smart data infrastructure and digitalize, digitalize, uh, digitalization infrastructure for agriculture value chain that will address all of the issues that you have shared with us. So we thank you very much. Thank and you very now much. I, 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 I yield the floor to um, Dr. Imad Ahmed of Energy Practice Lead from the Tony Blair uh, Institute for Global Change. We thank you for the opportunity on this segment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Balaji. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Ahmad Ahmed. I am an energy and climate advisor at the Tony Blair Institute uh, for Global Change. We provide policy and delivery support to 17 governments in Africa through our 200 embedded advisors within the centers of government and ministries of energy, agriculture, and ICT. Uh, we're very happy to be uh, a part of this forum and thank you for inviting us to be here. It's my pleasure to welcome Ms. Uh, Ms. Elizabeth Benny Amisa, who is a partner at Energy Access Ventures, an Africa-focused investor that backs companies decentralizing and digitizing key services. Through her work, Elizabeth sets on the board, sits on the board of a, a multitude of companies working on off-grid solar solutions, including Zonful Energy in Zimbabwe, CNDI in South Africa and India, I hope I've pronounced that correctly, um, Nuru in the DRC, Sun Culture, which specializes in solar irrigation solutions and is based in Kenya, and Manocap Energy in West Africa. Elizabeth, welcome. 
Thank you Elizabeth. so much, doc, Dr. Ahmad. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Can you hear me, Ahmad? I, I can hear you. Great. Thank you. Elizabeth. Thank you for that introduction. Thank you to the Malabo um, Montpellier panel for the invitation to join you all. It's very rare that the investor set uh, in venture capital and private equity get to opine on um, topics such as this. So I'm very happy to be here. And a special thank you to Dr. Debisi Araba for dropping my name and suggestion. So thank you so much. <laughs> Excellent. Um, Elizabeth, I've been informed that we have eight minutes total, so it'll be a little bit quicker than anticipated. Um, no problem. Great. Um, well, we have, as you know, over 500 million people um, lacking access to clean, reliable and affordable energy across Africa. And about 80% of those um, who do not have access in sub-Saharan Africa live in rural areas. Uh, without this access, food systems and agricultural uh, activities remain burdensome and inefficient, forcing farmers to revert to manual or animal power. Electricity is also essential for cold storage and processing. For you, what are the top three priorities for electricity use in rural areas? Thank you so much for that question. I think we have looked at rural electrification quite extensively in the last 30 years in Africa. And I think one of the missing pieces of it, and I think another, another uh, panelist spoke about this, is how we have worked in silos. So I think in terms of energy access, we focus so much about getting electrons generated and people access to electricity in the terms of lighting, but we have oftentimes forgotten the productivity angle of it. And so what I'm so proud of our work here at EAV, we're a $90 million fund that invested uh, primarily in solar home systems and mini grids. We pivoted about two years into our investment strategy to focus on energy for productive use. And as such, we focused on uh, solar powered irrigation systems, um, first mile cooling pack and pack houses for irrigation, for, uh, for agriculture, as well as connectivity and uh, clean cookie gas. I say all this to say, rural electrification story only works if the end game is to create new centers of productive life, livelihood, and for the people who live there. I think if we get this right, um, we have the ability to solve other social problems like rural urban migration, if people have the ability to stay home and to actually um, create value added services and products, um, we create uh, the logistics to get those markets to, to, to get those products to market, it's plausible that we can actually extend not just electricity access, but actually productivity centers across the country. I think um, it's very important to I take the example of mini grids and solar home systems. Um, we thought that, you know, giving access to electricity in the form of a solar panel on a house or a small grid that generated, transmitted, transmitted and distributed was enough. But we're now seeing that the evolution of that is to be able to layer other service. The uh, gentleman who spoke on digitalization talked about connectivity, being able to create a digital marketplace to find out where your goods can go and where there are access to goods that you and resources that you need. I think the ability to irrigate all year long increases yield, but cold storage as well as pack houses inc increases yield retention. And so um, I think the top areas I would focus on are regulatory and policy frameworks that are interdisciplinary and integrate not only energy by itself, but energy as it relates to other sectors, your um, uh, telecoms, um, agriculture and the like. I think the other focus would be uh, tax incentives. Another person talked about this as well, being able to uh, import those um, inputs at a favorable cost. Often unit economics is the problem. Um, you have a great solution and even on a pay as you go basis, it's still way too expensive for the person that needs to be able to pay for it. Um, and so being able to create those tax incentives, not only for the companies that import those inputs, but uh, further kind of support on subsidies to make sure the unit economics work for the end and um, customer. I have a third, but I think we should move on to the other other questions since uh, oh, we're running well, out of time. Actually, you're answering <laughs> one. You, you're you're well into answering one of my other questions, which was exactly um, that: um, how how can policy interventions support greater use of electricity and energy in, in food systems? So please please carry on. Um, sure. So by way of background, I was a grid scale, utility scale power developer for the better part of the last 12 years before I made the jump to venture capital. And I think what we convince ourselves on the large scale is that if you 
plan a 500 megawatt plant somewhere and it, you connect it to the grid, you assume that it will have impact. What is nice about the lessons of that is that we still need those big power plants for baseload, but to be able to service kind of off grid or those who are further from the grid, we really need to think holistically about how um, we look at value chains. I think that's the most important thing. So one person might solve the irrigation product problem and you now have increased yields, but how do you make sure those yields translate into products that are sold into real money for the, the, the smallholder farmer, but more importantly, for real food access, either in a domestic market or in the international market. And so the linkages between power, irrigation, and um, uh, cold storage on the agriculture side, the mobility side of things, actual transportation to get it there, um, and then the connectivity to be able to connect resources. I think it's really important that government understands that when they're formulating energy policy, they should think of agriculture um, and communic ICT as well. And when they're formulating agriculture policy, they should think about energy inputs as well. So it really should be an amalgamation of every ministry, uh, any, every directorate that exists at the government level, working hand in hand to make their goals. So for example, I'm Ghanaian. We established our energy policy in 2010 to 2025. I just look at the policy and, and it, I was, it was very hard for me to find a specific agricultural focus on that. I think we often also tie ourselves to one type of technology, which tends to be solar, but I think there are lessons learned in communities where they are using biomass uh, from byproduct from processing their own inputs to be able to turn that either into biofuel, uh, biogas, or even just um, uh, biomass and burning. So I think um, government's job is to create the enabling environment and the incentives uh, to let private sector come and duke it out so that you get not only value for money, but you get innovation and you get disrupted disruption of the status quo. Br brilliant, Elizabeth. I, I, I really like the um, joined up thinking there, talking about the whole um, value chain from one end to the other um, and, and talking about mm -hmm. how across, you need to work across government, not, not just one sector or, or, or ministry. Just on that um, last point, um, who, who, who are the key stakeholders, for, um, do you think, for, for achieving SDG 7? Um, and, and then we'll round out that, this conversation and introduce the next few. Honestly, everybody on this call, we all have a, <laughs> a, a role to play. I think obviously we look to the multilaterals, the development banks, the DFIs, um, we look to government entities. We hope that the private sector will show up and come up with innovative ideas, but oftentimes, as I have seen, I'm working in a dollar-based or actually euro-based fund. And so we're investing in hard currency in companies that end up providing products to end users that are paying back in local currency. So I think it will take both public and private sector. It will take financial services in industry. It will take institutional investors to create uh, investment products and facilities to be able to make sure that we are giving these products and services at a fair cost to those at the bottom of the pyramid um, so that they actually have a chance to be able to hang on to that first rung of the ladder to start kind of building on uh, economic development and economic livelihood. Um, I think that, you know, C for all, um, shout out to Dami Lola, she's doing a really great job being able to kind of put SGC, SGC, SDG 7 at the forefront, but really when you start looking at it, we have a lot of tentacles that are, are connected to so many others. And it's really um, been a center for an, inter an interdisciplinary approach to using an energy as an enabler. We say at our fund, energy enables everything. And so being able to look past just the generation of it and the access of it for lighting, but actually to drive economic development and productivity. Great. Thank you, Elizabeth. And I, I just want to um, remark on one thing you said earlier, um, which was keep people um, who are living rural lives um, to stay at home, incentivize them to stay at home and become um, more productive in, in what they're doing. That's exactly what the Tennessee Valley Authority achieved uh, 90, 100 years ago, 90 years ago, um, with electrification of households. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Thank I'm you, now too. Going 
It's been a pleasure. I'm now going to uh, give the floor to Mr. Tom Arland, uh, uh, Arnold, uh, Chair of Irish 2030 Agri-Food Strategy Committee and member of the Malibu Montpellier panel. Uh, Tom, thank you. Thank you very much, Gareth. Uh, well, we're coming to the end of our far side, side chats and we are under time pressure. So I, I'm, I'm very delighted to introduce Dr. Bagor Batelli, uh, the founder of La Leche du, du Berger. Uh, and we're going to talk about this crucially important issue of livestock. We know the importance of livestock across Africa, but it's of particular importance in Senegal. Uh, it's, it, it, it contributes there 30% of to agricultural GDP. And yet Senegal continues to be strongly dependent on livestock imports, in particular of dairy products, to meet its domestic demands. So my question is, what are the main challenges faced by the private sector to increase domestic production? And what are some key actions that are required from both the public and private sectors to overcome these issues? Bagor, are you there? Ah, you are. Excellent. We can't hear you yet. Yeah. Okay. So you, you hear me now? Hear we now. Yes, indeed. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. So um, I apologize. I will do it in, in, in French because my English is uh, not good enough to, to go ahead. Uh, donc, um, en effet, uh, au Sénégal, uh, mais comme dans beaucoup de pays uh, du Sahel, uh, on a beaucoup d'éleveurs. C'est une grosse partie de la population. Et pourtant, euh, on a du mal à connecter les produits de ces éleveurs, le lait, la viande, en tout cas, parlons du lait aujourd'hui, on a du mal à connecter le lait qui est produit par ces petits éleveurs euh, au marché. Euh, donc, jusqu'ici, il y a beaucoup de PME euh, qui importent du lait en poudre parce qu'il est moins cher. Ils importent du lait, ces PME importent du lait en poudre et elles fabriquent des produits finis qu'elles mettent sur le marché avec des des marques qui sont assez performantes, donc il y a des fortes croissances sur l'activité économique de ces PME, mais ça, ça ne profite pas aux éleveurs. Donc, disons que l'infrastructure que constituent ces PME hein, de mise en marché, de transformation du lait et de mise en marché, n'arrive pas à être connectée euh, au, au, à la production des, des, des petites compétitivités. En fait. Ces PME disent… Si j'achète du lait local, ça me coûte beaucoup plus cher, 50% ou 100% cher que si j'importe du lait euh, en poudre. D'autant plus que le lait en poudre, on le sait, euh, euh, est finalement pas très cher sur, sur le marché international. Et en plus, il y a des, il y a des, des productions, disons, euh, enfin des, des spécialités qui, qui, qui utilisent de la poudre de lait écrémée et de la matière grasse végétale qui ont un bon goût finalement et qui sont encore moins chers que le lait en poudre. Donc, je dirais, un des gros problèmes, et ce qui, qui constitue euh, un statu quo, un, un statu quo euh, euh, disons, mortifère pour les, pour les filières euh, d'élevage local, un des gros problèmes, c'est euh, le, 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 le prix en fait, auquel on peut produire le lait et qui n'est pas intéressant pour les, pour les, pour les PME, les off-takers qui pourraient mettre le produit sur le marché. Okay, Th thank you very much for, for, that, for that response. My second and final question is, there is evidence which shows that a well-functioning livestock production value chain can improve farmers' incomes and can be a, an important source of employment and income. What are some of your recommendations in order to create and amplify the employment and income opportunities for women and youth in the livestock value chain in Senegal. Merci, merci Tom. Euh, mais effectivement, dans, dans le cadre de, de l'entreprise que je dirige, mais dans d'autres entreprises aussi qui ont réussi à acheter le lait aux petits éleveurs, euh, on voit l'impact sur l'emploi euh, des, des éleveurs, en particulier les femmes. Vous savez que dans le Sahel, c'est surtout les femmes qui s'occupent des vaches laitières, qui font la traite et la commercialisation du lait et les jeunes, les jeunes qui accompagnent les troupeaux pendant la journée pour aller au pâturage. Dans, dans, dans le cadre de mon entreprise, pour donner un benchmark, il y a quatre fois plus d'emplois au niveau des, des, des éleveurs que dans l'entreprise elle-même. Donc, la création d'emplois est quatre fois plus forte si on, si on achète du lait local 
que euh, par rapport à, aux emplois qu'on crée dans les entreprises, enfin, dans le benchmark que nous, on a dans mon entreprise, c'est celui-là. Donc, euh, c'est extrêmement puissant comme, comme, comme levier d'emploi. Et, et je dirais que, pour insister, euh, le type d'emploi qu'on crée dans, dans les zones rurales, c est, c est, ça, ça, ça cible des gens qui n'ont pas beaucoup d'autres compétences. Donc, on, on, on crée des emplois pour des gens qui ne sont pas employables. Et, et euh, le fait d'acheter le lait, c'est vraiment… Ça, ça permet d'avoir de, des revenus constants et, et de, de, de rentrer dans une vraie, euh, disons, théorie du changement, un vrai schéma de, de changement, une vraie trajectoire de changement euh, sur le temps long où, en plus, les éleveurs acquièrent d'autres compétences. On parlait tout à l'heure de l'accès euh, à l'information ou en tout cas à l'économie, même grâce au smartphone, à la bancarisation, etc. En tout cas, euh, ça, 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 ça apporte sur le temps long beaucoup d'autres compétences qui permettent aux éleveurs et à leurs enfants de rentrer progressivement dans la classe moyenne. Donc, à mon avis, à mon avis euh, la, 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 la chose clé, comme il a été dit aussi hein, précédemment dans ces discussions, c'est de, de réussir à constituer des données, euh, 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 le bon niveau de données. Quand on dit que le lait local, par exemple, est moins cher que le lait importé, bon, ça c'est vrai si on compte le, le, le prix du lait seulement. Mais quand on voit les externalités positives qu'il y a à, à acheter le lait local, hein, la, la stabilisation dans les territoires euh, de l'activité, de, de l'économie, euh, le, 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 les effets d'entraînement, tous les essais d'entraînement en, sur euh, l'achat d'intrants de, de, en élevage, etc. etc. Bon, si on était capable euh, de, de, de faire des analyses, euh, euh, bon, c'est en fait, ça sur, une chose sur laquelle on travaille aujourd'hui au Sénégal, c'est donc des analyses euh, qui incluraient un peu plus ces externalités et pour, pour, pour démontrer, disons, à la fois au gouvernement, enfin, à commencer par le gouvernement, qu'il aurait intérêt à avoir une politique économique euh, euh, qui permette en fait, de sortir de ce statu quo où les éleveurs sont, sont, ne sont pas inclus dans les marchés. Donc, dans cette politique économique, il y aurait notamment de l'amorçage par subvention pour que le prix du lait euh, produit par les éleveurs, euh, les petits éleveurs, soit ramené au même niveau, disons, de, de compétitivité que euh, le lait en poudre pendant un certain temps, hein, le temps qu'il euh, y ait un amorçage euh, du lien avec l'industrie et puis le temps aussi que les éleveurs rentrent dans une démarche de production euh, et donc progressivement qu'ils puissent euh, améliorer leur rendement. Thank you very much indeed, Bago. So now, could I hand back to our Master of Ceremonies, Dr. Lael Boutake. Lael. Thank you very much, Mr. Tom Anno. Thank you to all our speakers. We are successfully powering through this agenda, and we are now nearing the end of the ninth Malabo Montpellier Forum. Please welcome to the stage Ambassador at large for His Majesty the King of Morocco and co-chair of the Malabo Montpellier Forum, Her Excellency Asia Ben Salah Alawi. Your Excellency, the floor is yours. Your Excellency, I can see she's on the call. Can you hear me? While waiting for the co-chair, um, I will now hand over to Professor Joachim von Braun, who is co-chair of the Malabo Montpellier panel. Thank you. Let me um, have a few final reflections and uh, maybe our co-chair, uh, Ambassador Asia. Ben Salah Alawi uh, comes back uh, in a moment, then she would have the final word. Uh, dear colleagues, what brings us together today is um, recipes for success. 
Recipes for Success, Policy Innovations for Food Systems Transformation, Building Resilience and Adapting to Climate Change. This is not just the title of the volume uh, which we released today, it captures um, our mission and strategy, our mission and strategy of the Malabo Montpellier panel. We in the MAMO uh, panel like to learn from successes. We are not interested in recipes for disasters. We need recipes for success. But we do take note of problems. The volume Recipes for Success documents the what and how that made actual successes in the seven themes which we have reflected today uh, possible. There are positive surprises in every MAMO panel report. We had excellent comments on the seven themes, nutrition, irrigation, mechanization, trade, digitization, energy, and livestock. These are cornerstones of a well-functioning food system. But we don't treat them in isolation. We connect them to system issues. And we had great roundtables. I want to make a few observations on the way forward relating to the UN Food System Summit and the Malabo commitments of Africa, the African Union. Number one, the true costs of food need to be identified and considered. These costs of health and of environmental damage of um, food systems that are not well functioning must come down everywhere, also in Africa. The benefits of a sustainable, efficient food system that delivers on the sustainable development goals need to be enhanced. These two costs of food are large. Secondly, the COVID-19 global pandemic has dramatically exposed the fragility of the food and agriculture sectors in Africa. We heard about the supply chain disruptions. We need to take note of the rising food prices, a concern, food price inflation, not only in Africa. But um, what we have learned is that health and food systems must come together much more closely. We from the food and agriculture systems perspective also need to get interested in the inequality issues of vaccine distribution and manufacturing of vaccines. These inequalities must be overcome quickly in consultations with development partners. And third, preparedness for climate change needs acceleration all over Africa. Good things, however, are happening, such as the Great Green Wall in the Sahel, which already shows high benefit cost ratios. We heard about the opportunities of irrigation and energy innovations. An emerging theme is sustainable bioeconomy in Africa. And fourth, let me relate to a key topic the UN Secretary General emphasized in his plan of action on the day of the Food Systems Summit. He emphasized accelerating means of implementation. Those means of implementation include especially governance of food systems, with participation, partnerships, and so on, accountability. Secondly, finance. And the summit has uh, left the issues open there. Uh, more needs to come. And science and innovation to end hunger for healthy diets, technology-based, and so on. The plan of action of the UN Secretary General has a strong emphasis on science and innovation, and that's what we also need to see in the implementation plans in Africa. Now scaling actions and implementation is needed. Today's consultations have offered a great basis for further contribution to the Malabo Montpellier panel. We take, can take note that our panel is surrounded by a tremendously insightful large community of panel partners that signal collaborative opportunities with the MAMO panel. The entity, our forum co-chair, His Excellency Haile Mariam, rightly calls a platform. This platform has been expanding and all speakers 
All panel chairs today are welcome to continue to cooperate with us on the platform, including, of course, also the participants on this um, virtual meeting. I want to acknowledge the tremendous work behind the scene by the MAMO team, the secretariat, and hand back to Lahi Butake. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Von Braun, co-chair of the Malabo Montpellier panel. And now it is my honor and pleasure to welcome to the stage the ambassador at large for His Majesty, the King of Morocco. She's equally the co-chair of the Malabo Montpellier Forum, Her Excellency Asya Ben Salah Alawi. Your Excellency, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, honorable chairman, honorable assistant, and uh, panel members. I'm so sorry because I had a technical breakdown, so that's why I disappeared for a moment. However, I really do thank um, Dr. Usman Badian and Professor Joachim von Braun for this invitation I'm honored to accept. I have more than one reason to be happy to join this group. First of all, on a personal note, I will reinforce the topic which is very dear to my heart of my PhD, food security. And actually I resumed this closer relation by creating with common friends in Morocco an eco fund who takes care of rural remote territories, helps women and link innovation with the territories and all this. So I'm happy as well as a woman to accept this invitation. And I'm very grateful to the first speaker on the first panel for his advocacy for the obvious, the necessity to promote, to empower women for the benefits, not only of the sector, but for society at large. I'm very happy as well that I'm joining in this very particular year, so rich, in meaningful events, not only for the sector, but for interconnected key sectors. Food System Summit, of course, with its zero hunger commitment and with the involvement of a vibrant uh, civil society and individuals. COP26, unfortunately, with very frustrating results. Earlier in the year, we had the Climate Summit and more specifically, we had the Africa Summit with its modest uh, contribution to face the pandemic and the, uh, um, pave the way for recovery. Ahead, we have the Democracy Summit. Unfortunately, it's regressing in Africa with a few coups, but still many countries, many African countries are gaining ground for democracy, for the benefit of populations at large and for the uh, youth in particular. I'm very happy as well because it is a very special year for your institutions, for Academia 2063, and for the panel, the MAMO uh, panel, the MAMO forum, because you just launched an extremely significant monograph uh, which by its own words represent the strides that have been achieved in this domain. And of course, I'm looking forward to learn much more about this recipes for success as you have labeled it. I'm happy as well to see my country, Morocco, paving the way as well and among the best performers in this sector. Thank you, Karim, for the involvement of the OCP group you represent in this panel, and which, of course, thanks to University Mohammed VI Polytechnic in particular, is reaching out through multiple partnership with the best institutions in the world, like MIT, Florida Tropical Food, to just name it, and reaching out to 14 for the time being centers in, across Africa. I'm very happy to see research so much developed for that. I would like to pay tribute as well of uh, Simhamd Aitqadi, who participated in this uh, panel, 
for his lifelong commitment to the progress of this sector in our country. More profoundly, I would like to say that the very transformation of the food systems that you are so much engaged in, and which is so grateful to the work that you have been carrying out, has a tremendous impact on the image of the activities related to the food sectors and beyond. Uh, before, we used to think of agriculture as being the activity of the old, poor, uh, rural populations. Today, with more investment, more research, more digitalization, more modernization, it is really gaining attractivity because the activities are as well more rewarding and can be even much more with all the efforts you are deploying. So I think it's a great encouragement for our youth who unfortunately are subject to massive unemployment, as you know. I would like to finish. I don't want to be too long. You have said it all. I don't have anything to say because I have a lot to discover. So I would like to finish on a very positive note and go even beyond, because I'm convinced that the centrality of the transformation of the food systems and its multiple interconnections with the key areas and systems for sustainability of life of mankind on this planet, this is the real stake, will offer more opportunities to our youth, to populations at large in the continent. Youth in particular, I'm very much attached to this because they will stay on the site. They will stay in our continent and will contribute with their talents, with their energy to the global transformation of our continent and the implementation of the very ambitious uh, agenda 2063. And in the process, hopefully, the whole narrative about Mama Africa will be altered for the better. Thank you very much once again for your attention. Thank you so much, Your Excellency Alawi, for those powerful words. What a wonderful way to end this meeting, the ninth edition of the Malabo Montpellier Forum. And there you have it, we have come to the end of the ninth edition of the Malabo Montpellier Forum. Please monitor the chat box and click on the links. We have shared so many resources with you, read the report, stand by for post event highlights through our newsletter. And we will see you at our upcoming events. Thank you to all our panelists. Thank you for joining us and see you very soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, thank you. Bye-bye.